Ivo, maybe you should explain uh, Rosa, Rosa, Rosa's situation, uh, a situação da Rosa, porque nem todo mundo sabe. Eu vou falar. Ah, você vai falar? Ah, tá. Ok. Pode deixar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome. We now are going to have our le last lecture. Uh, it, would it would be uh, by Rosa Maria Calcaterra, professor of Università di Roma 3, Italia. But unfortunately, she cannot be here. So, uh, Professor Hoku Monti from Italy, too, is going to read her paper, who had already been, uh, who, who was already, uh, uh, already, already sent to us. And then afterwards, Professor Eunice uh, Quintili Gonzalez is going to comment her paper. Then afterwards, we can debate. Uh, as is go the session is now being broadcast by YouTube and recorded, so Professor Calcaterra can watch uh, the debate and the comments by Professor Eunice when she is recovered. So, uh, é, agora a gente vai começar a, a última sessão do Encontro de Pragmatismo, que deveria ser é, feita pela professora Rosa Calcaterra, mas infelizmente ela não, não pôde estar aqui hoje, portanto o professor Rocco fará a leitura do texto dela que já tinha sido enviado. É, depois a professora Eunice Gonzalez fará o comentário, nós abriremos para debate, como essa sessão está sendo transmitida pelo YouTube e também gravada, a professora Rosa poderá assistir os comentários e o debate e também a apresentação do trabalho dela. É, então, eu passo a palavra para o professor Vô, que fará a apresentação e, a, e, e também fará o compartilhamento de tela. Now I, I pass the floor to professor Vô, who, who is going to read Rosa's Calcaterra's paper and uh, will share also, we will also share the screen with her paper. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, um, just one thing before starting. Um, I'm not a professor, I'm just a PhD student. And uh, I'm so sorry that uh, Rosa Maria cannot be, cannot be here. And I'm also sorry for the fact that you will hear her paper through my voice. So just please be gentle with me. Um, so the Rosa Maria paper title is Logic, Ontology and Heart, the Virtual Circle of Dewey Aesthetics. It is a common opinion that art experience is in large part a, fi a fine tuning of the routing and continuity of art with the ontological condition of the human being, already alighted by Dewey in experience and nature, with the continuous os oscillation of life between fragility and vigor, weakness and energy, disorder and harmony. Dewey is now engaged in distilling the anthropological historical sources and function of the artistic event in such a way as to show its profound connection from beginning to end with the various forms of experience, from the most rude and ordinary to the scientific, moral, and political, expressing indeed the ontological implication of artistic experience. These pages often suggest the long wave of Kant's thought. More precisely, what comes to the fore is the use of the term Kunst in the anthropology from, from a pragmatic point of view, in fact, this work apparently uses such locution as emblematic of the ontological and epistemic double-sidedness of the human condition, of its inescapable link both with the slippery determination of sensitive nature and with the significant and conciliatory sovereignty of reason, both with the determination of the physical world and with the heroic potential of freedom. Michel Foucault observed that the word Kunst and its derivatives as they occur in Kant's anthropology are amongst the most inaccessible to translation, just because they signal a radical ambivalence. 
Indeed, the term does not designate any specific art, nor even a technique. Rather, indicates the fact that nothing is ever given without being, at the same time, exposed to the danger of an undertaking that grounds it in construction, and at the same time, it dodges it the arbitrary. In particular, the French philosopher emphasized that Kunst denies the idea that the human being is ontologically and epistemically marked only by passivity, that is, by the mere capacity to passively receive data, both external and internal to subjectivity. However, the denial of passivity as an original human sign is full of complex consequences, because such a denial can and must be understood as spontaneity, as well as artifice. And its role is as much to construct an appearance above and in contrast to phenomenon, as it, is give, as, as, it, as it is to give the appearance, the fullness and sense of the phenomenon. In other words, Kunst holds, but in form of freedom, the power of mutual negation of the shine and the erscheinung. And even the deepest level buried in original passivity, even that which is most given in the sensible data is open to, to display of freedom. In the theoretical depth of the term Kunst, Foucault sees at work the thematic continuity as well as of the perspective difference between the transcendental commitment of the Kantian critiques and the discourse of the anthropology from the pragmatic point of view. This is mainly due to the conception of temporality that shifts the constitutive link between time and transcendental subjectivity in the relationship between time and Kunst. It is a shift that undermines the self-referential solidity of the a priori synthesis and opens the space for considering the problematic correlation between sensitivity and rationality. For the purposes of a reflection on new aesthetics, it is crucial Foucault's assertion that Kant's concept of Kunst indicates, that, indicates the fact that nothing is ever given without the risk of artifice, and yet, and yet also signals that Kunst it is more than mere artificiality precisely because it attests to the exquisitely human ontological condition that is freedom. Artifice and spontaneity cohabit in the semantic balance of Kant's concept of Kunst, precisely insofar as nothing is ever given to human consciousness except through the freedom it enjoys, but it must be added of which human consciousness inexorably falls victim whenever it does not recognize the limits of its own possibilities of achieving definite and uncontroversial truth. In any case, just by virtue of the semantic and functional intimacy between artifice and illusion, Kunst does, does not undermine the ontological principle of human freedom. Rather, such intimacy exhibits the most Kantian character of Kunst, namely the fact that it constitutes a human possibility to be implemented and not an essential datum, arranged, accord, arranged according to well-determined or self-sufficient operational rules. In fact, the characterization of freedom as a peculiar potentiality of human being allowed to consider Kunst as a specific declination of the image of the human being provided by Kantian anthropology, namely the concept of the human subject as a rational being or a being capable to be guided by his ability to reflect and to reason on his own sensory nature, thus to be not exclusively dominated by the latter. One, one can say that Dewey's conception of artistic experience tends to reshape all these in terms of an empiricist philosophy that expands the plane of sensibility in order to pour freedom into the power of imagination and art. Only the empiricist attitude, do you assert, accept experience and life in all its uncertainty, in all its mystery, doubt, and quasi-knowledge, and turn that experience toward, it, toward itself in order to render its quality deeper and more intense in the direction of the image and art. Imagination and art have precisely the power and at the same time, the assignment of reconstructing according to ever new balances, the intrinsic uncertainty and vulnerability of the human condition. We know how Dewey distanced itself from Kant, considering his attempt to overcome the difficulties of classical empiricism <clears throat> and rationalism unsatisfactory. Obviously, this is not the right place to enter into this question. I'm interested instead in highlighting the anti-deterministic and constructive significance that Kant concept of Kunst shares with the overall structure of Dewey's thought, as well as with his conception of art as a crucial, crucially important activity for the ontological inquiry and the logical processes, which this inquiry implies. 
According to my inter interpretative hypothesis, both aspects ascend, albeit with very different accent, in Jewish theory of art. In fact, such contexts show a conception of the artistic gaze as a privileged as a privileged way to access what Foucault calls the seriousness of the phenomenon, or to grasp the fullness and the sense of what is given and felt in experience. <clears throat> For Dewey, the latter is the correspondent of the original unity and receptivity and dynamism, of datedness and creative freedom within which human reality unfolds. Moreover, it is important to note Dewey's commitment to showing how the temporal character and historicity are inescapable ingredients of the human possibility to understanding this original unity, and therefore he emphasizes his ontological and epistemic fragility. To help this line of interpretation, a few quick notes on the Dewey interception of Kant's thought via Sylvester Morris will be useful. In the most concise summary of the matter, let us say that Dewey welcomes the Königsberg philosopher's effort to safeguard the cognitive value of sensory perception and thus to free philosophy from the pretense of transcending the limits of empirical knowledge. At the same time, Dewey accused Kant's transcendental philosophy of an untenable ambiguity. First of all, the reduction of the traditional distinction between the natural and the intellectual spheres to the universality and the atemporality of the human mind structures or of, the, or of their power. Moreover, Dewey criticized Kant's postulation of the existence of a noumenal world that included freedom as a distinctive character of reason. Freedom justified both the moral dimension and the very possibility of understanding phenomena precisely by virtue of their detachment from mere sensory determination in the name of the autonomy and sovereignty of the rational structures of the human mind. The blaming of, the, of Kantian link between the noumenal world and freedom constitutes a crucial point in Dewey's choice in favor of a Darwinian style naturali naturalistic empiricism, according to which freedom appears as a human factor that, that is coextensive which the biological indeterminacy of reality or the ontological dimension. For Dewey, as for all pragmatists, the most philosophically relevant element of Darwinian biology is the promotion of an anti-determinist view of the natural world, of which human reality itself is an integral part. Accordingly, freedom and its, value, and its various expression, cognitive, moral, and aesthetics, can rightly be ascribed to the biological sphere or, or placed on the ontological continuum between the physical natural world and the cultural world. In this regard, it is not secondary to keep in mind, to keep in mind the, inten the intention to work on the level of empirical observation to which Kant's anthropology refers. As is well known, Kant is formally skeptical about the scientific value of anthropology, just as he is about psychology. Indeed, the weight of the transcendental normativity of reason with respect to the sphere of sensibility is very prominent in this text as well. We are talking about a point of basic divergence with Dewey, since in his view, not only does the empirical method entail a specific epistemological normativity, but is also the vehicle of an ontological knowledge implying the, con implying the continuum of the different facets of reality. Therefore, empiric method cover a wider and more articulated thematic field than that concerning freedom, which Foucault considers linked to use of the term Kunst in Kant's anthropology. In particular, from Dewey's point of view, using the empirical method means following James in breaking with the isolationism on which philo philosophical psychology, extending from Descartes to Kant via Locke, gravitates. More exactly, it means bringing into play a notion of experience that embraces both the relation and the discrete, discrete moments of the interactive process that take place between mind and word, between physical and psychic, psychical reality. And finally, between sensory and rational elements. The ontological implications of this anti dualist notion of experience are deeply linked to the anthropological value Dewey assigned to artistic production, in which he sees an expression of the natural vitality of the human being, a particular channel of his vital energies. It is a moment in which the balances of human living condition are reconstructed and at the same time enriched a moment whose roots lie, lies in human-animal relationship with the surrounding environment. The term energy occurs with insistence, especially in the first chapter of Art's experience entitled The Living Creature, and gradually covers a range of meanings from the most immediate level of naturalness to the most anthropologically sophisticated. 
In other words, harmonious cell balancing and expansion of biological condition go hand in hand, but this is possible precisely because in life and even in the inanimate world, there is more than mere flux and change. Indeed, there is a system of a relationship that composes an intrinsic order, albeit one, albeit one that is always in flux, or an order within, change, which, within which changes are interdependent and mutually supportive. Dewey, like James, insists on the objective, objective character of this harmonious order of nature, so much that he argues that to obtain a subjective condition of harmony not based on the objectivity of natural relations is, is to risk madness. Harmony is related to feelings of happiness and joy, which are nothing but the results of a process of adaptation of our well-being to the conditions of existence, an adaptation that occurred through a continuous reconstruction of experience. The ontological and at the same time anthropological depth of art is specifically at stake in this interplay of condition that gradually reveal the inveterate memory of an underlying harmony, the sense of which owns life, owns life like the sense of being founded on earth. Dewey has no doubts. Understanding aesthetic experience necessarily requires considering animal life below the level of man, recognizing the profound connection that exists between art and aesthetic perception, with the struggle and successes that punctuate the active and vigilant commerce of organisms with the world around them what you understand by the term experience. It is vital and vital. Art is in fact intensified vitality that intrinsically aspires to harmony and stability, which however, do not mean stagnation by rhythm in evolution. From this point of view, every experience is art in germ. It contains even in its most rudimentary forms, the aspiration, the aspiration to pleasantness that, that characterizes aesthetic experience. It goes without saying, then, that the first task facing the philosopher of the fine arts is, in his word, to restore continuity between those refined and intense forms of experience that are works of art and the events, facts, and everyday suffering that, as is universally recognized, constitute experience. This means first connecting art to the qualities captured in ordinary experience, in order to identify the forces that favor the normal evolution of ordinary human activities. This is a wide, widespread interpretative tendency to radically contrast Peirce's pragmatism with that of James and Dewey. For instance, in his Thinking Through Imagination, John Cagg reiterates the widely accepted claim that Dewey was not interested in exploring ontological issues. More precisely, Cagg argues that Dewey wanted to dodge Peirce's deep and sincere commitment to developing a philosophical project aimed at establishing a solid link between pragmatist logic and a realist ontology. Dewey stated that he was convinced that Peirce's logical position is separable from his ontological position, especially if one considered that he formulated the latter in different ways, in the sense of medieval realism, in the Kantian sense, and even in the term of pampsychism. Thus, Dewey declared that he was, he was content to take Peirce for what he specifically was, namely a pragmatist or pragmaticist, while necessarily means being a realist rather than an idealist. Interestingly, interest, interestingly Kag contrasts Peirce and Dewey by concentrating on the question of imaginative or creating reason, which is treated by Peirce in a particularly articulate way, expressing his typical attitude of never being satisfied with the result of his own research. In fact, according to Peirce, imaginative or creative experience occurs when philosophical and logical reasoning both particularly impervious or fails. Yet he felt that the detailed description of the nature of this type of experience represented a highly problematic task, hence an endless task. It is worth questioning the possibility of contrasting person Dewey on the basis of a presumed speculative superiority of a physical project, in our case, Peirce project, constantly aimed, as Kag says, at squaring the circle between logic and ontology through a deeper investigation of imagination, whereas Dewey is said to have abdicated this task. The reflection proposed in these pages tended to contest precisely this way of seeing which, in my opinion, is not reflected in an analysis of Dewey thought, which knows, first of all, how to do without the prejudicial interpretative decision to contrast the presumed superficiality of his humanistic naturalism with the philosophical depth of Peirce's pragmatism. 
there is no doubt that person Dewey declined the theory of sensitivity or aesthetics experience according to different approaches. However, fruitful element of consonants can be identified, which would help to understand how their respective philosophical proposal present a continuity within difference rather than insoluble speculative contrast. In particular, it would be very interesting to analyze the relationship between the Dewey and concept of artistic experience and Peirce as assertion of the firm, inseparable interwining of the three categories of firstness, secondness, and thirdness, to which he clearly assigns as logical semiotic value and at the same time an ontological value. I would pointing out that the commitment to work on the continuities in differences rather than on the rigid opposition between the classical representatives of pragmatism also helps to pursue their common philosophical project and, let us say, to move beyond the necessary philological analysis of their test and to further develop the most representative suggestion. This type of work also acquires what Peirce and Dewey refer to as the typically human ability to imagine to think creatively, which evidently means in their vocabularies, carrying out productive experiences of meaning and action that can increase our knowledge, our relation with the physical, natural, and social cultural environment in which we are immersed. Thank you, Vroko. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Popu Villa, uh, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, now I pass the floor to Professor Ilnisi, who is going to comment Professor Calcaterra uh, paper. Uh, eu queria agradecer ao Ivo e a todo o seu time maravilhoso, uh, super eficiente, carinhoso, que apesar de todas as dificuldades que a gente está passando aqui, conseguem levar adiante a chama do, dos encontros do pragmatismo. So I would like to thank Ivo and all his very efficient and energetic uh, team. Uh, that uh, despite of all the difficulties we are facing here, uh, they can keep us here and keep alive the flame of our uh, meetings on pragmatism. So thank you, Ivo, and thank you, uh, all the, uh, his fantastic team. Também quero agradecer ao, uh, a todas as minhas fontes de inspiração maravilhosa, sem as quais Eu acho que não estaria vivo. So I would like to thank um, all this um, source of inspirations. Without, I would not be alive. Thank you. Uh, bom, eu tenho uma difícil tarefa de comentar um texto da nossa querida Rosa, que infelizmente não está aqui. Né? Mas como a gente está gravando, uh, eu vou esperar que a Rosa melhor e logo estamos mandando todo o nosso amor para a Rosa para que ela se recupere logo e esteja aqui com a gente presencialmente no próximo encontro Rosa vai adiante so uh, I said I have uh, this difficult task to uh, dialogue with Rosa who's not here uh, but uh, as this is recorded have uh, sending this message to Rosa to be well soon please we need you be back soon and well. So I will bring this question to you people, everybody who um, would like to discuss with the questions and Rosa will complement or disagree or agree in the, uh, as uh, she can listen in to the uh, comments and questions. Então, eu estou dizendo que essa difícil tarefa de dialogar com a Rosa que não está aqui, né? Uh, Mas é, como isso está sendo gravado, a gente espera que a Rosa escute quando ela já estiver muito melhor e que ela possa complementar as perguntas que eu vou dirigir a todos vocês 
é, principalmente aí quem entende muito mais do que eu de Dewey e, de, uh, é, e do próprio artigo da, da Rosa. Né? Então, fiz um breve uh, comentário que eu vou ler agora em, em português. É, então, uh, no contexto, quer dizer, no seu artigo, que é bastante inspirador, né? quem conhece a Rosa sabe que não poderia deixar de ser assim, a Rosa Calcaterra argumenta que a postura filosófica de Dewey eh, em relação ao elo entre lógica, arte e ontologia não é menos ubíqua do que a de Peirce. Bom, essa é uma, uma, uma claim muito uh, polêmico, né? mas no contexto da experiência estética, ela ressalta que, eu cito, né, não há dúvida de que Peirce e Dewey recusaram a teoria da sensibilidade em experiência estética ou experiência estética de acordo com diferentes abordagens. Né? Então, ela reconhece as diferenças. Mas, que, no entanto, ela argumenta que é possível identificar elementos frutíferos de consonância que ajudam a compreender né, como as suas respectivas propostas filosóficas apresenta uma continuidade na diferença. Veja que bonito, uma continuidade na diferença, ao invés de contrastar, de contrastes especulativos aí insolúveis. Então, a Rosa a Maria está principalmente interessada em ressaltar o ponto de que a concepção kantiana de arte, no seu sentido antideterminista e construtivo, é parte compartilhada na estrutura geral do pensamento do Dewey e também é, na sua concepção de arte, é, ali concebida como uma atividade crucialmente importante na inquirição ontológica e nos processos lógicos nela implicados. É, no contexto ontológico, ela, a Rosa ressalta que, bom, é opinião comum que arte como experiência né, é, em grande parte, um ajuste fino do enraizamento e continuidade da arte com a condição ontológica do ser humano. Já foi destacada por Dewey a experiência e natureza. Ou seja, com a contínua oscilação da vida entre fragilidade e vigor, fraqueza e energia, desordem e harmonia. Ela também uh, nos lembra que para o Dewey, a arte é de fato vitalidade intensificada, que aspira intrinsecamente à harmonia e à estabilidade, o que, no entanto, não significa estagnação, mas ritmo em evolução. E a harmonia, ela continua, está relacionada aos sentimentos de felicidade e de alegria, que nada mais são do que resultados de um processo de adaptação de todo o nosso ser aí às condições da existência. Uma adaptação que vai ocorrer por meio de uma reconstrução contínua da experiência. Bom, então, considerando essa breve resumo aí das passagens selecionadas do belo artigo da, da Rosa Maria, as minhas perguntas uh, são, né? Bom, segundo Dewey, os lugares comuns biológicos né, são as raízes da estética na experiência. Ela vai falar né, que nós precisamos ter, uh, ver o que está antes do humano né, no plano biológico. E é muito difícil a gente pensar aqui que, independente da noção de evolução. Então, a minha primeira pergunta naivo, né, ingênua, é em que sentido de entenderia que existe evolução na arte? A segunda pergunta, é, no contexto aí contemporâneo da nossa complexa realidade virtual, algumas obras de arte são produzidas por máquinas. Né? Bom, a pergunta que eu faço a Rosa, mas ah, para todos os todos nós, né? é, se a concepção estética de Dewey contemplaria tais obras, como a exemplificada aí nesse quadro abaixo. 
O que, que acontece aqui? Esse rapaz, o Jason Allen, venceu um concurso anual de artes da Feira Estadual de Colorado através dos recursos de uh, Mid Journey, que é esse laboratório que tem uh, esses programas de inteligência artificial né, que transformam frases de texto em desenhos hiperrealistas. Então, o rapaz escreveu lá no Teatro de Obras Espacial e a máquina produziu essa figura que está aí ao lado. Ele imprimiu, colocou numa tela, avisou a todos que tinha feito com recursos de computação e venceu esse festival em primeiro lugar, gerando uma super polêmica. Então, a pergunta é, será que o Dewey contemplaria esse tipo de arte que está mais frequente com a Ida e outros, que muitas vezes são feitos quase que sem intervenção do humano, né? como uma obra artística? Né? Onde é está a vitalidade? Onde é que está a vida? Né? Essa é a segunda pergunta. Né? Bom, a, a terceira pergunta, também bastante em, em, é ingênua, eu acho, é entre o elo lógico, entre Peirce e Dewey, é aí no domínio da lógica, qual é, então, segundo Dewey, uh, o papel do raciocínio abdutivo na experiência artística? Será que o artista vive sempre atormentado com problemas, que ele precisa encontrar uma solução, iniciando a abdução a cada instante? Ou ele está lá em estado de meditação e uh, tem uma lógica por trás para a geração uh, das, suas, das suas obras? Né? Então, sou mais, uh, minha pergunta é essa. Né? Uh, tem ali o, o raciocínio abdutivo lá que ligaria, por sendo tão importante né, na sua filosofia, a, a obra artística em Dewey. Bom, a quarta questão é, considerando que a dimensão subjetiva do artista né, faz parte da experiência artística né, no seu cotidiano e tal, e que a arte é, segundo Dewey, como a gente mencionou, né, de fato, vitalidade intensificada, né? que aspira intrinsecamente à harmonia e à estabilidade, na passagem que ela ressaltou, né? ainda que não signifique a estagnação, mas um ritmo em evolução, né? como é que a gente pode entender a experiência artística, por exemplo, de um monge ou de um Van Gogh, cujas histórias de vida e obra parecem estar um certo sentido ali, em descompasso com a sociedade do seu tempo, expressando interesses, assim, intensos conflitos e dores que levam, levaram até o suicídio, por exemplo. Né? Ali parece que eles estão tão longe dessa busca de, de harmonia e da felicidade, da alegria que o, que o Lu acha que está presente na obra. Como é que a gente pode entender esse tipo de experiência artística. E a última questão, né? é, me parece, e essa é uma questão é, que acho que talvez vocês possam, com a Rosa, é, bater um carimbo, é que a hipótese do a Porciana é de que o instinto e a razão parecem compartilhar uma origem comum né? qual seja, elas pertencem a uma única natureza que busca segurança nas informações disponíveis no ambiente aí a fim de iniciar e manter vivo o processo de ajuste de hábitos. Né? Seria essa hipótese aí, persiana, a raiz, uma das raízes mais profundas desse círculo virtuoso que a Rosa a Maria propõe Uh, que o, o Dewey que estaria lá entre a estética, a lógica e a arte, unindo ali ao, ao Peirce. Bom, essas são as questões que eu formulei e uh, agradeço, então, pela oportunidade de pensarmos aqui todos juntos essas questões relevantes, em especial nesses tempos tão difíceis que a gente está passando, mas que vão passar.
Obrigada. Thank you. Obrigada, muito obrigada, professora Eunice, como sempre, questões altamente complexas e relevantes. Thank you very much, professor. Always putting together very special thoughts and, and questions for us to think about. So now I open to debate. Uh, if you, anyone would like to make a question or a commentary, please. Just, you can open your microphone or raise your hand or put on, on the chat. Please, Professor Ines. Yeah, I have a, a, a just a remark about um, the last question uh, uh, that we that was just asked about the abductive reasoning and aesthetic experience. And I thought of um, of um, when you think of what an artist is up against, a painter or a writer or a dancer or or sculptor or whatever, uh, there are constraints on what they're they're able to produce that is novel. Uh, and it's it's dependent upon obviously the materials, the, the dancers, the material of the body and the painter with all the things with pigments and canvases and brushes and all that stuff and the different types of um, materials that a sculpture would use, whether they're using um, uh, um, uh, granite or marble or whatever it would be, even in the ones working in metal types of things. All of those materials have uh, possibilities, and uh, their possibilities are are sometimes surprising for the artists themselves. But there is no art without some material underpinning. So I would think that um, the the approach to abduction here in artistic creation has to be wedded to those materials, those material supports that are that reveal possibilities of form that were not even planned beforehand. Because we mustn't assume that the original plan is able to be carried to uh, completion. And I think this was, Peirce made the wonderful comment that uh, he could not think if he didn't have his inkstand. That he said, without my inkstand, I am not able to think. Mm -hmm. I need yeah. my inkstand, right? Just as we may need find out that we can no longer write by longhand, we cannot write by hand, but we need the computer. We have to type. It's impossible to think without typing. And uh, I once had a professor who said uh, thinking was typing. He was a very well-known <laughs> philosopher, but he wasn't sitting down uh, uh, filling out index cards by hand. So I wonder whether we can generalize that and say, yes, there is. Dewey would recognize very clearly uh, the role of abduction, uh, but in the in the Persian sense, not of necessarily arriving at a abstract idea, but arriving at uh, the concretion of a of a of an anticipated and emerging form uh, that would at which point the painter or the artist would realize that they have arrived where there's no longer anything else to do in the terms of in the production process. So in that sense, there is an, a, a productive abduction uh, element, I think, that's deeply embedded in aesthetic behavior and aesthetic act, uh, uh, activities. Yeah, my, my doubt uh, emerged from listening to Professor Ivo when he mentions this state of uh, firstness, relaxation, in which mm -hmm. inspiration comes. And so... Um, I was wondering, I agree with you at the material level, we have to think about what's the material and all this, but the artistic inspiration, my doubt was about that. Do we need really uh, starting with a problem? I don't know. What do you think, Ivo? <laughs> Uh, microphone, your microphone is, is closed. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, I'd like to highlight two points in your commentary. One is regarding abduction in the, the same way uh, maybe that Dennis was considering abduction as a, 
a sort of uh, uh, conjecturing state of mind. Uh, we can uh, admit that, uh, accept that, that there, there, are, there is a, a sort of a, a deduction in art, but uh, we need to, to differentiate between the aim of abduction in art and the aim of abduction in science. Science has the aim of truth or to, to validate some theory as, uh, as legitimate by experience. And then the result, the final result is uh, something which will have uh, a, 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 a monosemic sense the sense of being or not being true. This is not the aim of art. Art doesn't need to, to, to search for truth in the sense of a monosemic theory or a monosemic system of science. So I, I will say that abduction is, uh, uh, in art is a permanent state of, uh, of the sign of art. The sign is always abductive. And then uh, this is what which characterize art as freedom, freedom of freedom of creation in the sense of uh, the classical aesthetics from uh, Schelling, Schopenhauer, even Hegel, and verses in verse. And its product is uh, polysemic, which which will be open to a set of interpretation and sense and meaning. Uh, this is this is quite interesting to remark. You know, it's difference between conjecturing art, conjecturing in science. The final end is monosemic, a monosemic sign. And the other one, the polysemic sign, uh, preserving preserving the original freedom or firstness uh, that inspired the, mm -hmm. the artist. Another point to, to, to highlight, I think that would you be worse to, to think about, is about uh, harmony and happiness in art. Well, this is not true. Harmony and, and, and happiness, it's possible, but there are a lot of art full of pain, suffering, and tragedy. Look at, the, for example, the, the Puccini's opera, Tosca, Madame Butterfly, and so on. <laughs> they are dramas, terrible dramas, and terrible, terribly, terribly beautiful. The beauty of the pain, the beauty of the human suffering. Well, this appears also in the in the in poetry. If you read, uh, if you read <clears throat> a poetry, for example, from uh, from Hilke, the poem that the poems of Hilke they are terrible. Terribly um, suffered, suffered uh, uh, in face of the beauty, the uh, so far beauty that cannot be conquered by someone who, who is uh, in, in love with him, with it. And uh, the poetry of loss, of losing uh, something. The poetry of death, the poetry of uh, every every kind of tragedy. This is very frequent in even in music. The music of Brahms, for example, is terrible suffering. <laughs> he was in love with the the wife of his best friend, Schumann. Clara Schumann was the Robert Schumann's wife, and. He, he was passionate. He has a, a, a big passion for Clara Schumann. It was terribly suffering, suffering for him. And mostly of his uh, work 
is in minor tune, in the minor tune, very sad, very melancholic. It was, he, he said this, um, almost all dedicated to Clara, that impossible, as an impossible passion, impossible love, impossible uh, existential relationship. Then harmony and happiness is not uh, exclusive predicate of art. Art, uh, art must denounce this multiple face of human existence. Regarding uh, emotional interpretants and qualities that are the environment of this, all these objects that art brings to us. Okay, it's only two observations, <laughs> short observations about your, your question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ibri. Uh, uh, can I uh, add just a quick a comment to Ivo? Uh, You know, a big poeta que fala, o poeta é um fingidor, ele finge tão completamente que chega a fingir que é dor, a dor que devera sente. Né? Acho que talvez uh, o que a Rosa estava tentando trazer aí para a, a, a discussão era se, é, mesmo fingindo né, é, que está sentindo dor, no fundo ele está buscando a felicidade, era nesse, nesse sentido. Não sei como traduzir essa, essa passagem do poeta, que é um fingidor, talvez você consiga. Que ele finge tão completamente que chega a fingir que é dor, a dor que devera sente. Né? Well, the artist is dealing with imagination. So imagination create everything, every kind of objects, every kind of world, every kind of uh, context. Uh, and then... Uh, Maybe, maybe some artists are not really feeling what he's dealing with. It's a product of his own imagination. Uh, on the contrary, Brahms was really feeling that suffering, you know. And then uh, I, I understand this this sentence in this in this in this way, you know. Uh, We can we can bring any many many examples about this. Uh, are all artists really feeling what they are expressing in their art, or is maybe some fake creation <laughs> from imagination? I don't know. Thank you, Ivo. Thank you very much for the discussion. I think uh, we have five more minutes. If... Ah, Professor Detien, please. Um, yes. Um, I had been, um, maybe Bob English would know this far better than I do. Um, in the 1930s, when the persons collected papers, began to be published, John Dewey spent a lot of time studying those volumes and reviewing them. Um, and uh, that also spurred him to write a few articles um, that explored in scholarly detail um, process category theory. And, and uh, I, I have been wondering to what extent that study had an important impact on his sub subsequent studies, especially regarding uh, um, um, ex experiential nature or his work on, on what we could call the philosophy of art and the experience of art. I, I, that, that is a, a question I, I had, but um, Rosa was asking, it seems in her paper, um, whether there had been um, studies that were seeking to bring Pers and Dewey uh, um, in close connection regarding their approaches to aesthetics. 
and uh, um, that reminded me that there is a, a scholar um, um, who is influent in the semiotic society of America. Her name is Deborah Aisha Cat. And uh, um, she has been intrigued by, she is a phenomenologist and a, and a communicologist. Um, and uh, she has been lately much drawn by in her study of the connection between Perth and Dewey as far as uh, the connection of aesthetics and ethics is concerned. Uh, she, she produced a, a paper in the last issue of her journal that was called Felt Qualities Embodied Intensities and the Precarity of Relational Fulfillment. And uh, uh, that, that paper goes deeply into Perth and then deeply into Dewey and makes a number of connections between thematic themes in, uh, in the two authors. Um, and uh, uh, what intrigues her especially is at the, even at the level of quality science um, or quality significance, um, um, are all of those important uh, accompaniments to the experience to the daily or the, the quotidian or normal aesthetic experience that accompanies every production that comes from either artist but also from anyone who is engaged in making some trust of great importance and she, had to, she, she, she talked about the importance of the voice and its vibrations. She talked about um, the importance of uh, the rhythms that are attached to the production uh, uh, of, of uh, all sorts of gestures and, and other kind of manifestations in finding connection between that and uh, uh, Dewey's understanding of the embodied rhythms um, and that those embodied rhythms do accompany in Persian semiotic terms um, all kinds of utterances because uh, they, they call for emotional and energetic interpretants uh, that emphasize the, not, not only the rhetoric of what is being said, but that, but also manifest an appeal to the other and make also the other uh, um, more available. Uh, um, so there is a logic of otherness that, co that comes out of this aesthetic uh, experience, both in Persian terms and Dewey terms. Um, but I see that uh, Bob wants to reply. <laughs> In this sense, and uh, uh, you think that uh, she would say that this kind of uh, artistic inverted commas products uh, generated by artificial intelligence are do do we would say it's no art there at all? What do you think about that? I would say that artificial intelligence uh, enhances what some elements of our perception in the way that any other device does. There are extensions of our bodies, but it is all, only meant to be experienced by us because the machine cannot experience it, but can provide other ways. But it's all up to us to 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 do to, to make that experience uh, and to turn it into something that is valuable. Um, but we should not ascribe to the machine themselves um, um, the capacity to to to, to uh, substitute themselves for ourselves. Uh, I think Roberta, uh, uh, Professor Eden, wants to... Okay, I, uh, uh, you asked a question, Andrea, about uh, uh, the, the Purse-Dewey connection. As a matter of fact, uh, the book that I have to... Uh, I'm going to be talking about my own book. Uh, chapter 3 deals explicitly with uh, Purse and Dewey. It's called under the title Quality and the Theory of Science. And uh, the original version of that was published in uh, the Cadernos de uh, Semiotica Persiana. Uh, by uh, that Fernando uh, Zalamea uh, uh, edits, and the uh, also in the uh, the Bluesberry Companion to um, Persia and Semiotics, uh, I wrote the long chapter, like a forty-page chapter, on uh, basically on Persia and, and Dewey at the same time. So there are there is a there is a sort of a uh, that's a close subject from one from one point of view and. Uh, uh, the, the Dewey's 1935 paper very clearly showed that there was no antipathy between him and Peirce vis-a-vis aesthetics because it's his third 1935 paper is called Peirce's Theory of Quality. And he says, it's clear that Peirce has given us the handle on how to have access to experience as, as, as experience and how a, a, a philosophical aesthetics would do that too. But that this is a more 
even more important, philosophy itself can be returned to experience in a way that is that uh, uh, is truly is is truly uh, fruitful. And uh, likewise, in 1945, he wrote a paper on uh, on uh, Peirce's theory of linguistic signs, etc., and meaning, where he completely validates uh, Peirce's theory of quality once again, and also. Uh, shows uh, the uh, the importance of the of the notion of thirdness. Although Dewey did not have any affinity with or did not accept the one, two, three, or the firstness, secondness, thirdness terminology, but he recapitulates those. He actually exemplifies those and verifies that those uh, terms refer to dimensions of experience that are irreducible to one another. He's very, very clear about that, but he was not happy with the term, with the terminology. But if you look throughout Dewey's works, you will see a constant reference to quality, strain, and continuities. It's there. It runs through all throughout uh, uh, Arda's experience, just as the flights and perchings of a bird image that he got from James also permeates that. So uh, Dewey was not trying to invent something out of totally out of a, a pull, pull a rabbit out of a hat, but that he uh, he had these deep connections, specifically in what we're talking about here, to the uh, the Persian the the Persian elements. Uh, uh, it, it was not there was no form of real aggression. There was a kind of appropriation uh, without identification. You could put it that way. Uh, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all for uh, all of you for the comments and the debate. It's very rich. I, I'm sure uh, Professor Calcaterra will watch it uh, when she recovers. And uh, obrigada a todos pelo debate, pelas questões, por enriquecer o assunto. Espero que é, quando a professora Rosa Calcaterra melhorar, ela possa assistir a esse vídeo. Now I must end this section, unfortunately, because we have, uh, in 15 minutes, a, a book presentation from the uh, author himself, Professor Robert Innes, is going to uh, present us with his speech about his book, The Mansion of Aesthetic Encounters, Perception, Interpretation, and the Sign of Art. So we, and then afterwards, we will have the uh, closing of our uh, meeting. Now, uh, eu preciso de encerrar, infelizmente, essa sessão. Uh, porque daqui a 15 minutos teremos uma nova sessão, a apresentação do livro pelo próprio autor, o professor Roberto Robert Nunes, o livro Dimensões dos Encontros Estéticos, Percepção, Interpretação e os Signos da Arte. E depois teremos o encerramento do, do, do nosso é, 21º Encontro sobre Pragmatismo. Então, é, agradeço a todos e espero... Vamos, vamos é, você... agradecer também a, a, o trabalho do Roku. Thank you, Roku, for, Thank you. for doing the Thank job. You. Thank you, Roku. Thank you, Professor Eunice. And then we invite you all to uh, come again here in 15 minutes. Nós convidamos a todos para voltarem a esta sessão, esta sala, em 15 minutos. Okay. Até daqui a pouco. See you soon. Obrigada. Bye. Rosa, send you. Or love. Thank you. Bye-bye. Tchau.